Hello, I'm Miss Kilburn Bond from Malmesbury School and I'm going to try and help you understand the poem Remains by Simon Armitage. So I'll just start off by just telling you what I'm hoping you'll um, get out of this video. First of all, I'm hoping at the end you'll understand, having read the poem, the feelings and the attitudes that come across in Simon Armitage's poem. That's Assessment Objective 1. Then I'm going to give you some ideas about how you could explore and analyse the effect of language, form and structure in the poem. That's a Assessment Objective 2 and finally for Assessment Objective 3 I'm just going to give you a little bit of information to help you appreciate the poem's context, so where the poem comes from, what might have motivated Simon Armitage to write it. And what you're going to need for the video is a copy of the poem in front of you, which you should have in your anthology, and a pen or a pencil, a highlighter, something that will help you annotate your copy of the poem. But before we do that, I'm just going to get you to think to start off with, to engage you with the idea in the poem. So I want you to imagine you're in the British Army and whilst on duty in a war-torn country in the Middle East, maybe Afghanistan or Iraq, you're sent out to tackle looters raiding a bank. One of them legs it up the road, probably armed, possibly not. What would you do? Why would you do it? And what might be the effects of the decision that you make? So the looter legs it up the road, probably armed, but possibly not. What do you do? Well, in the pressure of the moment, you decide to shoot. The looter is killed and his body is put in the back of a lorry and taken away. It's a moment you never forget. Months later, you are back in Britain and diagnosed with PTSD. And in case you don't know, PTSD stands for Post Traumatic Stress Disorder. It's a type of anxiety disorder which you can develop after being involved in or witnessing a traumatic event. So anybody can um, develop PTSD as a result of a traumatic event, and that can be any kind of event, but it's often talked about in relation to war veterans. And in fact, in the First World War, we didn't understand it with this term, but you might have heard First World War soldiers being described as having shell shock, and we now understand that that was PTSD. So that situation that I described at the beginning is the story behind the poem. So the poem was um, inspired by a documentary that was on Channel 4 called The Not Dead, and that is on, available online if you wanted to watch the whole documentary. In 2007, the poet Simon Armitage, in this documentary, decided to explore the stories of damaged, exhausted men who returned from war in body, but never wholly in mind. So in the documentary he interviews and talks to a lot of veterans who have been really affected mentally by their experiences of being in conflict. And one of those poems, Remains, has made it into your AQA Power and Conflict anthology and it's a poem that's inspired by his interview with a veteran soldier from the Gulf War. So one of the interesting things about this poem is it's actually based on a real story. So there is a real person behind the narrative. And so you understand and appreciate that context, I'm just going to let you watch now an extract from that documentary where you're going to meet Guardsman Troman, who is the real soldier behind the poem. And as you're watching, you'll hear extracts from the poem. What I really want you to think about is the experience of this one man and how his emotions are then translated into the poem once we start reading it. On the outside, I acted cool, calm, which is pretty much what every one of us was doing. But on the inside, you're frightened. It's not a nice place to be. And I don't mean physically, I mean emotionally. It's hard to put into words. You're in constant fear of your life. That's... I think that's why I 
I got into so much trouble when I got back. Because I was in the mind frame of, well, just come back from a place where everyone wants me dead. So to, so to die around there wouldn't be such a bad thing. I was born just before the Falklands War. Uh, that's probably why I, I, I'd like to have been a soldier. So much seeing all the troops coming back to the era of celebrations and that. I don't suppose I looked in too much depth, but you used to see what the media would show you, and it, it all looked good. We crossed the border into Iraq, and we made our way slowly but surely towards Basra. I was in a section, seven people in the back of a warrior. You drive with the warrior, the gunner, and the commander. And I, I was machine gunner, first one out the back of the warrior. For the first couple of weeks, we sort of formed a ring of steel around Basra. And the, the mortars was raining in on us, airily. The first one would land, you'd get in a ditch or anything. And you'd see, say, 50 metres away, the next one would land. 30 metres away. The next one would land 15 metres away. You'd think, carries on like this, the next one's on my head. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever been in a car crash or you've been mugged and you get that feeling for that split second when the butterflies are going and everything where you don't know what's going to happen to you. If you can imagine that feeling 24 hours a day, seven days a week, that's what it felt like to be out there. occasion we get sent out to tackle looters raiding a bank and one of them legs it up the road probably armed possibly not well myself and somebody else and somebody else are all of the same mind so all three of us open fire three of a kind let him fly and I swear I see every round as it rips through his life I see broad daylight on the other side In, in total, I think it took 12 rounds. And I, I can still to this day remember as every round passed through. And he was lying there with his insides basically on the floor. And we had to leave him, clear the bank. And he was there approximately four storeys high, four or five storeys. And we cleared the entire of the bank, got to the roof. I looked over. The bloke was still there, crying in agony. We come back down, and uh, another lad who was in my section literally picked his insides up, dropped them back into his body, and he was uh, he was just chucked into the back of the warrior, never to be seen again. That's the first time I had it ever ended someone's life. I didn't have time to think. It was over in seconds, like, done. 
But to this day, there ain't a day that goes by that I don't go through that whole situation in my head. So I hope you find that interesting. I certainly find it a really moving clip to watch. And we're going to go straight now into listening to a reading of the poem. Now this comes from the BBC Bite Size website, which has got a lot more information or about the poem if you're interested in reading more. And I'll say now that there are lots of other revision resources available online about the poem. The great thing about English literature, one of the things that I love is you could get 10 English teachers talking about this poem and they might all say slightly different things, look at, concentrate on different images and find different things interesting. So it is worth always having a look and reading and listening to lots of different people who love literature talking about this poem because there'll be things that you get from each person. But the BBC Bite Size website is always a good place to start and we're now going to listen to a, um, a reading of the poem. What I'd like you to do is after you've listened to it I'd like you to pause the video and then on your own just silently I'd like you to read the poem through at least twice because every time you read a poem you'll absorb a little bit more and you'll understand a little bit more of it. Remains by Simon Armitage. On another occasion we got sent out to tackle looters raiding a bank and one of them legs it up the road probably armed Possibly not. While myself and somebody else and somebody else are all of the same mind, so all three of us open fire. Three of a kind all letting fly, and I swear I see every round as it rips through his life. I see broad daylight on the other side. So we've hit this looter a dozen times, and he's there on the ground, sort of inside out, pain itself the image of agony. One of my mates goes by and tosses his guts back into his body. Then he's carted off in the back of a lorry. End of story, except not really. His blood shadow stays on the street and out on patrol I walk right over it week after week. Then I'm home on leave, but I blink and he bursts again through the doors of the bank, sleep and he's probably armed and possibly not. Dream, and he's torn apart by a dozen rounds. And the drink and the drugs won't flush him out. He's here in my head when I close my eyes, dug in behind enemy lines, not left for dead in some distant, sun-stunned, sand-smothered land, or six feet under in desert sand, but near to the knuckle, here and now, his bloody life in my bloody hands. Okay, so I think we're ready now to go through the poem and have a look at some of the details. Now what I've decided to do is not to annotate on the screen with my ideas about the poem because I think there's a danger of you simply copying what I'm annotating rather than thinking for yourself and translating things into language that you understand and that you would naturally use. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through each stanza and talk about some of the ideas that I find interesting and you can obviously pause the video and make your own notes but it's really important that you understand the notes that you're making in your own annotations. So don't be tempted to copy every single word I say. Try and summarise, take the things that you find most interesting and helpful and then put those into your own words as you're labelling your copy of the poem. But the screen you're looking at now, you can see the title. I normally start by talking about a title, but actually on this occasion I'm going to really focus on the title once we've gone through the whole poem because I think that helps a bit more. But in the bottom right hand corner you can see a little picture of a notebook that says literary terms. What I've done is where I think I might use um, some vocabulary that you might not be familiar with or that might challenge you to extend your vocabulary then I have given you a word and a definition. So if I do use a term that you're not familiar with hopefully you'll be able to see that definition and if you need to you'll be able to make a note of that somewhere. It says literary terms, um, I've been a bit generous with that, sometimes it's not necessarily a literary term, it's just a word I'm using that I think maybe some of you might not be familiar with. Okay so remains, the title, all I'm going to say is that the definition of remains, just listen to this, the parts left over after other parts have been removed, used, 
or destroyed. And we'll come back to that at the end of the poem because I think it's a really very clever title that only really makes sense once we've understood the poem as a whole. So stanza one, we immediately start this poem with the idea of it being a monologue. So this poem is a story that's being told to us. It's a series, it sounds like the narrator's giving us a series of anecdotes. So little stories that the reader is listening in on. So it's like we're part of a conversation and this soldier is telling us not just one story, but a whole list of things that's happened to him whilst in conflict. And this is just one of those things. So that first phrase, on another occasion we got sent out, really emphasises this idea that we are not just focusing on this one story really. This is part of a whole range of things, probably traumatic events, that have happened to him. And that's important because we're immediately, as the reader, reminded that as a soldier in conflict, then this narrator has experienced such a huge amount of trauma and difficult situations. And also the idea, that it's actually quite normal for him to have another occasion where something traumatic happens. So we also get the idea here that this soldier's powerless. He has to follow orders. We got sent out. This isn't a decision that he's made himself. It's orders that he's following. So this idea of him being powerless and having to do what he's told. So they go out to tackle the looters and one of them legs it up the road. Legs it up the road is very colloquial language. So again, it all helps us with this idea that this is a soldier talking, chatting in a very normal way, very informal language describing something that's happened to him. So the soldier legs it up the road, probably armed, possibly not. Now those two adverbs, probably and possibly really important that we stop and pause and think about those. So first of all, we've got some alliteration that are pulling those two words together. Probably, possibly, both beginning with a P, and that deliberately makes those two words work together like a team. Simon Armitage wants us to think about those two words together. Now they're both adverbs of certainty. Probably, almost definitely, Possibly, not quite so sure. And this idea haunts this soldier and we'll come back to it towards the end of the poem. In this moment, he doesn't know whether this looter is armed or not. He doesn't know if the looter is going to be able to turn around and shoot or throw a grenade or homemade bomb over towards the soldiers. Probably he is. Their experience tells them that a looter is very probably armed, but it's not definite possibly not. And that uncertainty is what makes this soldier feel guilty in the future. It's this moment of uncertainty that torments him and makes him not sure about whether the decision they make was the right one. So I really want you to think about that. That's a quote that I think would be worth learning. It's something that hinges the whole meaning of the rest of the poem. So in stanza two, the story carries on. We're still in this very colloquial language. Well, myself and somebody else and somebody else. We've got these anonymous soldiers. They're just not named. There could be any soldier. So again, this idea that this is just a normal day. It could happen to anyone who's in this situation. We're all of the same mind. So all three of us open fire. Now, this solidarity, the fact that the three soldiers, they don't appear to talk to each other, but they are obviously trained to react in that same way. And they collectively make a decision that the safest thing for them to do, even though they're not entirely sure if this loot is armed, is they open fire. Three of a kind, all letting fly. So we've got that really casual colloquial language again, letting fly. That doesn't sound like a moment that's going to traumatise this man's mind for the rest of his life. It sounds like something that they all did as a group of mates together and in that moment it didn't actually seem that important. So we move into the next stanza now and I swear I see every round as it rips through his life. And we've got a slight change in the language here. We've now got lots of violent imagery is going to come into this stanza and that starts with this idea of every round of the bullets ripping through his life. It's metaphorical, this idea of ripping through this man's life and it shows us how quickly this man loses his life and how violently. 
I see broad daylight on the other side. It's a pretty shocking graphic image and if we go back to that definition of PTSD, often flashback is a really important and horrible experience of someone suffering with PTSD and you can see this line could clearly be something that's a flashback for this narrator. I see broad daylight on the other side, really shocking image of the looter being killed. So we've hit this looter a dozen times and he's there on the ground sort of inside out. And again, that language sort of inside out was still very colloquial, was still very conversational. There's also almost a childish type of language here, not really sure how to explain what's happened to this soldier, that idea of being sort of, very uncertain how to explain it, and inside out. It's a really horrifying visual image, um, but also one that sounds almost like a child, really uncertain and not sure about what's actually happening. So, sort of inside out, pain itself, the image of agony. And so this sentence finishes at the start of the next stanza and we've got another metaphor. This dying soul, this dying looter is the image of agony. It's like he's a picture of pain. One of my mates goes by and tosses his guts back into his body. Now, it's another quite shocking image in the poem. It's quite an uncomfortable read at times and what we get the sense of here is that this other soldier, one of his mates, seems desensitised to what's happening, tosses his guts back into his body. Well that word tosses, that verb, suggests a carelessness, suggests that it doesn't actually seem that big a deal to toss somebody's guts back into their body. For most of us reading this poem that's a pretty difficult line to read and quite an a horrifying image to think about. In fact, a lot of people wouldn't want to think about that. So this sort of nonchalant attitude that this is just something that happens, this is normal, all adds to the idea in this poem, this theme that actually for this soldier and for other soldiers like him, this kind of experience is their day-to-day -day existence. Then he's carted off in the back of a lorry. Now again, that phrase, that casual phrase, carted off, it doesn't, it's not what we expect when we hear about a death. There's no formality, no respect, no idea of treating that person with respect and then there being a potential funeral in the future. It just sounds like he's meaningless. His body is carted off in the back of a lorry. And then we move on at the start of the next stanza to a really important line in the poem that I'd like you all to um, make sure that you annotate in some way, please. So, the end of story, except not really. Now, this we can call the volta of the poem. It's the turning point. It's a moment when there's a dramatic shift in the tone and the theme of the poem. So, end of story, you'd expect a full stop there. End of story suggests, well, that's it. That's what happened. It's over. But adding except not really, that subordinate clause there is making it really obvious that for this soldier, life isn't that simple. One story doesn't end and then we move on and something else happens. And this is where we start to really explore his PTSD and how this event has particularly traumatised him, as you will have seen in the video we watched with Guardsman Truman. His blood shadow stays on the street. Now, blood shadow, really interesting image that Armitage has used here. So blood shadow could be the physical stain of blood on the, on the pavement, on the street, but I think it's more metaphorical really, the idea that the blood shadow is like a ghostly imaginary stain that even though there's nothing there, when this soldier walks past that particular place in the street it's like he's haunted by this shadowy blood that he imagines is still there on the street and it's the start of the idea that the death of this looter is haunting his mind. He cannot forget it. It's haunting his memories. Out on patrol I walk right over it week after week and that phrase week after week really emphasises that there is no escape. He has to keep reliving that moment and being haunted by that blood shadow again and again and again and again.
And then if we think about end of story and what we expected from that, and now we look at the next sentence, it's a very short, simple sentence, then I'm home on leave. We might think at that point that actually, oh, that's okay then, leave, being on leave, there's something that should be simple. We've got this expectation, well, that must be a relief. That must be a release from all these horrible things. Home is where he can feel safe. But following that immediately with that word, but, that conjunction there, but, I blink, changes that expectation. And we realise that being home on leave is not going to give him that release, that relief that maybe we hoped. But I blink. And then what happens here has happened before. You'll notice at the end of the stanza, there is no punctuation, there's no full stop, but I blink. And then as we move on to the next stanza, and he bursts again through the doors of the bank. And that's called enjambment. It's when the poet has deliberately not finished a complete idea at the end of one stanza, but has gone on to another line. And it's a really powerful example here, I think. But I blink was at the end of the stanza before. A blink, such a quick human behaviour that we do without even realising we're doing it. It's amazing the number of times a person blinks every minute. It's something you might want to have a look at. But I blink, this simple thing that we all do instinctively, and he bursts again through the doors of the bank. So there's this deliberate pause where there's a second of a blink and then we're straight back in the violence. So we've gone from the idea that perhaps there's going to be a release at home, being on leave somewhere safe, but there is no safety because just like being inside this narrator's mind, you cannot for one second relax because as soon as you even blink, bang, here comes the violence again. And he bursts again through the doors of the bank and that word bursts, this idea of the violence and the fast energy of it. And you'll see there's some more alliteration we could pick up here, blink and burst and bank. So this is a really sort of almost noisy, violent part of the poem that reflects the way that his mind is being tortured all the time. Sleep, and he's probably armed and possibly not. Dream, and he's torn apart by a dozen rounds. So there's two words there, sleep and dream. Usually we've got connotations of sleep and dream being peaceful, innocent, a time where we can rest and forget trauma. But for this soldier, for this narrator, we don't have that. So sleep, and he's probably armed and possibly not. In his sleep, we get the sense that the narrator is being tortured by this constant guilt. Was that soldier, uh, was that looter armed? or not. And you'll remember that we saw the same line in stanza one. So we've got this deliberate repetition from Simon Armitage where he deliberately repeats that phrase to show us that that uncertainty, probably, possibly, is what is haunting him even when he's safely home on leave. Dream? Well, he doesn't dream. He's having nightmares, really, isn't he? He's torn apart by a dozen rounds. So the, violent of that de the violence of that death is constantly going round in his mind, even when he's asleep. And the drink and the drugs won't flush him out. And that gives us this sense of just how damaged this soldier, this narrator is, that he's turning to drink and drugs out of desperation to try and cope with the way that he's thinking and feeling but even that isn't powerful enough to get rid of this horrific memory of this looter. He's here in my head when I close my eyes. So again, just like with the idea of the blink, closing eyes, and there is this looter constantly present. And if you think about the pre use of the present tense here, he's here in my head. This is happening now in the present tense, this looter is constantly there in this soldier's mind tormenting him, even when his eyes are closed, dug in behind enemy lines. So a brilliant military metaphor there, dug in behind lines, a military expression. Um, but he's talking about closing his eyes and almost like behind his closed eyes, this looter's dug in, constantly there as a threat to him, not left for dead in some distant place 
sun-stunned, sand-smothered land. So you'll notice it's a really long line there and we've got this description of the country and um, presumably somewhere in the Gulf, we don't know, maybe Afghanistan or Iraq, where this looter was killed. Sun-stunned, sand-smothered. Now we've got brilliant sibilance here with all those S sounds. Sun-stunned, sand-smothered. And what that does is the sound of those words just emphasises the distance and the difference between home and this place that should now be left behind now he's home on leave but isn't and again we've got violence here we've got the sun is stunning and the sand is smothering this place the memory of this place is not somewhere that he's thinking of as beautiful the sun and the sand that we might associate with a holiday are actually linked to things that are violent and difficult and tormenting again. So not left for dead in some distant sun stun, sand smothered land or six feet under in desert sand. So again we're returning to this idea that the looter whilst dead is not at peace, is not somewhere where this soldier can leave him behind. He's constantly haunting his thoughts, there's no safety or peace away from him. And then we get to the last stanza that you'll notice looks very different to the other. So the other stanzas have had these four lines and now we've got two lines. So like a couplet, although it's not, it doesn't rhyme, but we've got two lines at the end that are very deliberately put separately at the end as this kind of completed thought. Now this isn't a conclusion to a poem that brings happiness. It very deliberately, if we think about the structure of this poem, it tells us a story and in some ways the story gets worse because as we get to the end of the story, the second half after the Volta shows us that in the present now for this soldier, even though that moment has gone in his history, he can never get rid of it. It's still there in his mind tormenting him. And this couplet at the end really emphasises that idea by giving us this conclusion to the poem that is absolutely lacking in any hope or peace. And the metre, which is the sound pattern of the of those lines is exactly the same. So it brings these two lines together so there's something about them that sounds like nice and complete and like it's in a pattern. So, but near to the knuckle, here and now, his bloody life in my bloody hands. So let's look at near to the knuckle first. Well, if you think about knuckles, one of the images most people think of first is one of aggression. So often we think about knuckles and a closed fist for fighting. So near to the knuckle, everything linked to the idea of this dead looter is still making him think about aggression, making him feel stressed and tetchy and not at all safe or calm. Here and now, we've got two words there with the and in between, here and now, emphasising the present that this soldier is living in. His bloody life in my bloody hands. Now, the bloody could be linked to that colloquial language again, his anger showing through swearing. But it's hard not to think that Simon Armitage being um, a poet who loves Shakespeare and uses lots of images from poets and playwrights from the past isn't making a bit of a clever link here to Shakespeare's Macbeth. So if you don't know Macbeth yet, there's a very famous scene in Macbeth where Lady Macbeth in particular is sleepwalking and she's trying desperately to wash blood off her hands and she's doing that because in her sleep she's tormented by the guilt of the fact that her and her husband killed King Duncan and it's hard not to think that's not what Armitage is trying to get most readers to think about. His bloody life in my bloody hands is metaphorical to show that the soldier, the narrator, feels guilt for the death of that looter and it's like he can't get that blood out of his thoughts and that symbolises that guilt that he feels. Okay and that's the end of the poem so let's just go back to the title because titles are important they're there for a reason it's always worth for all of the poems making sure you've thought about the title and what's worth saying about it. So our title was Remains and remember the definition of remains the parts left over after other parts have been removed, used or destroyed. 
and that's a really clever title and there are several different interpretations that we can come up with here. We could look at remains as being the physical remains, if you like, of, of the looter who's been killed. There's a lot of graphic description about his remains. We had that awful line, remember, about um, tossing his guts back into his body, then the blood shadow on the street. So remains could be the, remain, the physical remains of that violent act. But also we've got the idea of the haunting of the looter who won't go away, who's embedded in the soldier's thoughts and is constantly haunting his memories and his dreams. So the remains of the looter being somebody who's tormenting him and, and is central to his experience of having PTSD. And then we can also think about remains as being about the soldier, the narrator's mental health, his own mind and what remains after he's had this experience of conflict. So as a soldier, he's gone into conflict, he's come home and what's been left is this destroyed mind and the mental health that he then has to live with. And you, know, you can come up with your own ideas about which one you think is the best reading of the title or you can think it could be a bit of all of them. But as I've said, it's really worth thinking about how the title helps to bring everything together. So I hope that's been helpful. Um, what I want to end with is just to remind you that when you're writing about this poem in the exam, you're going to be writing about it in a comparative way. You're going to have to make links with one of the other poems from your anthology. So I'm just going to go through very briefly, because it would be a very long video if I went into detail, but just a couple of poems that spring to my mind that would be worth you perhaps going and revisiting now we've looked at this and thinking, oh, I can see ways in which you could pull the poems together. So just to start off with, we've got London by Blake, another first person narrated poem where we've got this same sense of bitterness, a lack of hope at the end, the idea there's no power to change anything, so the powerlessness of the narrator and that bitterness, you could definitely do something with a comparison there. Think about Prelude from Wordsworth, that's also first person, and we've got this narrative of a life-changing event, very different events. You know, Wordsworth look, talking about his awe inspired of nature but how that actually changes the way that he thinks and feels in the future so you could definitely talk about memory and life-changing events. Charge of the Light Brigade from Tennyson, well we both see there in both those poems as soldiers as being powerless victims to military strategy but of course the absolute difference is that Tennyson celebrates that soul, those soldiers as being heroic in a third person sense whereas in Armitage's poem, he gives us this narrator who there's nothing to celebrate. There's no sense of being heroic or being respected as such. So in Exposure from Owen, we've got a first person account. Of course, Owen himself was a soldier in the First World War and did suffer from PTSD. So there's a really interesting comparison to be made there about the soldiers and the mental pressure of conflict and how they experience that. In Bayonet Charge by Hughes, we've got that fear and violence and lack of patriotic pride. So there's definitely some interesting things that we could work with there. And then War Photographer, Caroline Duffy, this similar idea of being haunted, I think is really interesting, misunderstood. And in both those poems, Remains and War Photographer, War Photographer comes home. In Remains, our soldier comes home, and yet home doesn't feel like a safe, comforting place. It's somewhere where they feel increasingly misunderstood, alienated, frightened. And finally, if we look at Kamikaze by Garland, we've definitely got that theme of guilt and the, return, the idea of the returning soldier and the lack of peace. So it'd be worth having a think about that comparison too. And that brings me to the end of um, this video. I really hope that's helped you and if we just go back to those learning objectives in theory, you should now be able to think about the feelings and attitudes in the poem, understand what actually happens and what the main thoughts and feelings are. Hopefully you've got some ideas now, things you could say about language, form and structure. And finally, I've given you a little bit of that context, the fact it's based on a true story. We're in the Gulf War, we can link Armitage being interested and, and angered by what he could see and wanting to reflect 
the way that soldiers often really struggling in the present with their mental health or as, as a result of what's happened to them in conflict. Okay, good luck with the rest of your work on the poem and thanks for listening. Bye.